bought the gun in Long Beach at a pawn shop called Lucky's. It was a Trojan 9mm. This is from the police report. Well, that's author Noah Hawley reading from The Good Father. His story revolves around an assassination. And imagine being the killer's dad. That's where we start in this book. He's asking himself a lot of questions, and we'll be asking Noah a few of our own. So stay with us to find out more about the novel and all about the author. Nowhere for more than four months. Sometimes he slept in his car. There was a journey he was taking. Check out the Spring 2013 Book Reads in store and get 50% off with our special code. Hello again. Welcome to the Richard and Judy Book Club in conjunction with WH Smith. And here's this week's book. It's called The Good Father by Noah Hawley. The Good Father gives us a different perspective on a criminal act. Perhaps there are a few echoes of we need to talk about Kevin in this book, but from a father's perspective. This is quite some piece of work. Jay Seagram is going to be the next president of the United States. He's the president in waiting. He's a sort of a deaf blend of Bill Clinton and President Kennedy, JFK. All the good bits. And he's going to save the world. The world's in a terrible state, and this man, Seagram, is going to put things right. And the whole world has invested its faith in him. And he's shot dead. He's assassinated. And the man who does the killing, very young guy, is caught on camera to a global audience holding the weapon that delivers the fatal shots. So there's witness evidence, there's forensic evidence. It's an open and shut case. Everybody thinks he did it. Except the boy's father, who's a doctor. And he sets out on a quest to prove his son Daniel's innocence. Now this makes him the most hated man in the United States, which is thirsting for revenge. But it's not just a story about justice. It's a story about American gun laws. It's fascinating about that. It's a story about conspiracy theories. It's fascinating about that. Sadly, Noah Hawley himself couldn't be here to talk about it, so we went to him. My name is Noah Hawley. I'm the author of The Good Father. I live in Austin, Texas, and, and also Los Angeles. I, I write out of a, a writer's cube uh, that I built in the backyard of my house in Austin. Uh, it's a room about 12 by 10, I guess. I have 29 bookshelves. They're all full. I write at a... Uh, a standing desk. Um, I like to stand when I work. I find it's better for me and the work. Move around uh, a bunch. I have a chair. I sit in the chair. Sometimes it's tall. It's a very tall chair. Uh, and sometimes I write in that. Why do I write? Uh, I write to figure out what I think. Uh, I write to tell stories. I think it's it's kind of a sickness, I think. The people who uh, um, who choose to become writers, it's more like uh, it, it chooses you. For me, uh, any uh, story starts with a question. Uh, with The Good Father, the question was, you know, uh, what do you do if your son is a bully? What do you do if, if no matter how much love and, and care you put into raising your child, they grow up to be somebody you don't recognize, which I think is every parent's um, fear. And so that question then, the story, what's the best story to tell that helps me to answer that question? My writing process uh, is, it's a job. I get up every morning, uh, I walk my daughter to school, uh, we, I tell her stories, we talk about things, uh, and I come home um, and, uh, and go out to my writer's cube. Uh, and I work all day. Um, you know, I also write for film and television, uh, and I've run a couple of n network television shows in the U.S., and, and uh, uh, you know, that's a very different process. That's, you know, I'm, I'm more the, uh, the CEO of a, of a corporation when I'm running a television show, but, but I treat writing fiction the same way as, as it's a job. I don't get precious about my muse or anything like that. You get up in the morning and you get to work and you, and you work all day. And, and not every day is filled with writing. Sometimes there's a, a lot of thinking that goes on. There's a lot of research that goes on. You're reading, you're, you're watching movies, you're interviewing people. Um, and sometimes you just need to walk away from the overt work uh, and take a walk. And that's also working. Um, which, if you have the right spouse, um, they will believe that you spent your whole day um, watching movies uh, and that that was working. And if you have the wrong spouse, then uh, just say you wrote all day. I have the right spouse, by the way. A bit more from Noah in a moment. 
But what did you think about the book, Richard? I, I thought it was absolutely top-level fiction writing. Um, I thought the concepts that he really comes to grips with um, are very timely. I mean, obviously, there's a huge trance of the book, which is all about America's attitude to guns. Mm. Um, and that's obviously very topical at the moment after the terrible shootings in Connecticut. Um, but it's very revealing about that, and it shows what I've always believed, which is that actually it's not that America has a gun culture. Uh, American culture is about guns. Guns is, uh, and the whole issue of guns is woven through the fabric of American culture in a way that probably can never be disentangled. It's certainly not in our lifetimes, I don't think, much as we all want it to be. Mm. Um, I also think he's fascinating about conspiracy theories. Yes, I was um, going to say. Not just the conspiracy theories that begin to form around his son, who... You know, he's not isn't necessarily guilty, despite the compelling evidence against him. You have to read the book to find out if he is. Um, but also, he, he directly goes head on into conspiracy theories over the Kennedys, for example, uh, and over Robert Kennedy, who was the second Kennedy brother to be shot. And he's very interesting about that. And, and I learned a lot about those theories and how they work. And what he what he seems to have established is that the more you go into any conspiracy theory and examine it, the more likely you are to believe it. It's quite it's quite the opposite that you think you disprove it. Um, actually, you tend you tend to be sucked into it, and even a, a, a and start you completely disregard um, the obvious negatives, and you, you just you just forget them, and you think because the the the, the conspiracy theory itself is so seductive. Um, yes. that you just want to believe it. And he explains why we want to believe it. And he says, uh, and it's only when you get an absolute piece of evidence that, that destroys it that people will accept that. He tells a wonderful story about, um, you remember after JFK's assassination in 63, there was the man with the umbrella? In some of the newsreels and photographs, there was a very mysterious dark-suited stranger holding a black umbrella that was open. And it was a gloriously sunny day in Dealey Plaza that day. And this man was never seen again, and he never came forward. And he, it, he became woven into the conspiracy theory that the man with the umbrella held some secret as to what, maybe it was a signal, maybe uh, the, the, the umbrella itself was a secret weapon of some kind, but he was definitely pivotal, everybody thought, mm. to believe in the conspiracy theories. Mm. And finally the guy came forward. He was just a regular Joe, and he came forward and identified himself at, to Congress in, in, in one of the hearings, and he was there making a, an obscure, eccentric protest about Kennedy's father and appeasement. And the umbrella was meant to symbolise Neville Chamberlain's umbrella at Munich in 1938. That's the truth of it. That's what it was about. Yeah. Nothing to do with the shooting at all. Yeah. And yet yeah. he dominated conspiracy theories for, for decades. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's what we think, but what about you? Enjoying the Spring Book Club collection? Tell us about your great reads and join the debate on Facebook slash Richard and Judy Book Club. Check out the Richard and Judy collection and get any of the titles for half price with our special code. Just quote 35 10 10 55. That's 35 10 10 55 at the tills. The code's also on your screen now. This offer entitles you to purchase one of the Richard and Judy Book Club titles for half the RRP. Subject to availability, cannot be used in conjunction with any other promotional voucher. No cash alternative. Noah Hawley's The Good Father. Do I dress for work? Uh, well, I wear clothes, obviously. Uh, I do dress... Um, in the in the TV uh, in in my Hollywood life, uh, I wear suits. I dress up. Someone once said, "You always want to look expensive," uh, which I agree with. Uh, when you're walking into meetings with um, with studio executives and network executives, um, and I also feel like uh, you know when I'm when I'm a, running a show, uh, I am the the president of that corporation. I I, I need to be a, an authority figure to some degree, and and so I dress for that. Um, when I'm just writing out in my in my studio, um, I, I'm not wearing a tie, but uh, I, I look nice. Um, I'll send you a picture. How did I develop this idea for the book? Uh, as I said earlier, it started with a question. Um, for me, my wife was um, she was pregnant with our first child, and and. Uh, I was. Uh, I had the questions that any expectant parent has: Who is this person going to be? Who 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 is going to come into our lives? And and um, you know, you always have a fear. I think that that a, a child will your child will be born with a, with a, their own personality. That that you know, or or I mean, the overt fears early on are that you're going to have a ha happy and healthy child, and then it gets a little more esoteric, and and you wonder. Um, who who that person is going to be, and 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 uh, and what role, if 
if any, you as a parent have in shaping them. Uh, and so that was the question, the idea of uh, the parent of an adult child who had committed a crime. Uh, I thought uh, early on about a more terrestrial crime, a murder or a, uh, something of that like, but I felt like I'd seen that story before. Um, and I've always been fascinated by this idea of the lone gunman, the American uh, archetype of a young man uh, adrift uh, in the country who sets his sights on uh, a larger-than-life figure in order to, to sort of make himself visible. And so this early on, these two ideas combined uh, in a way that felt really exciting to me. Uh, and made the book feel like it would be bigger than just um, one father's journey. Uh, and certainly given the uh, recent events, and by recent I mean the last 10 years, uh, in American culture, it is a disturbingly relevant story uh, for, for all of us, I think. Um, this idea that for some somehow we've lost control of our children and our culture and, and uh, um, we don't recognize each other anymore uh, and we can't trust our children in, in a way that is very frightening for people I think to feel like these kids will slip through the cracks uh, and, and um, one day you'll turn on the news or you'll get a phone call uh, and your whole life will change and that, that was the starting point for the book. Who is my favorite character in this book and why? Uh, it's hard for me to say that I have a favorite. I, I think I'm very proud of Daniel as a character, if only because I wanted to create one of these lone gunman ar archetypical characters. I wanted to create a, a living, breathing, three-dimensional person who could be capable of, of committing this crime. But I didn't want to explain him. To, to the reader. I didn't want to give all the answers. I wanted to present a journey that he'd taken as seen in many ways from the outside and I wanted to try to reconstruct for the reader why he might have done the things that he's accused of doing but I didn't want to say for sure. One of the last things that I wrote going through the editorial process was the section, the, the journal section uh, the excerpts from Daniel's journal, uh, and I was very nervous about that to suddenly be writing in his voice because I didn't want to pull the curtain back too much. I wanted to to show you how his mind was working and 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 what he was thinking about, but I I didn't want to, all the answers to be there. So it felt like a very delicate piece uh, of work to create that character, uh, and I'm very proud of that. My first career goal was to be a rock star. Uh, I was a musician, I played guitar and I sang, um, but I quickly realized I wasn't a night person, uh, which was problematic, uh, and I felt like maybe in the end I was overeducated to spend all of my time uh, in bars. Uh, and um, I had started fiction writing um, as an escape, as, as a, a way to be creative that didn't require um, living in a van with three filthy penniless men um, and at a certain point in my 20s uh, I left New York where I'd been living and struggling as a musician I moved to San Francisco and I focused on writing and uh, uh, within a couple of years I'd published my first novel and and I lived in San Francisco for 10 years where I was part of a writers collective called the Writers Grotto uh, we had 21 uh, writers and filmmakers uh, who had office space in an old converted dog and cat hospital and um, I'd go there every day, I'd bring my dog, uh, I'd do my writing, uh, we'd play some basketball um, and get lunch together and it was a it was a great community which I think is very important when you're doing such a, a solitary work. Uh, then I started writing for film and television so I started spending a lot of time in Los Angeles uh, then I moved to Los Angeles for a couple of years. I worked on a show called Bones, uh, which uh, was a great experience. Uh, and then in the third year, 
I created my own show called The Unusuals, and, and then I created another show called My Generation. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, along the way I married a seventh generation Texan, and I didn't read the fine print, and now I live in Texas. So um, that is my story. If you want any of our previous recommendations, do check out our website where you can also watch videos with all the authors. Check out whsmith.co.uk slash Richard and Judy. Coming up, we're joined by author Grace McLean to talk about her land of decoration. I went to a land of decoration once. Oh, really, dear? Yeah, really, really. I thought I was never going to get out. I was just following those arrows on the floor and there were hundreds of men just like me going round and round, totally lost. But you enjoyed the hot dog at the end, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Richard and Judy recommending great books for you, exclusive to WH Smith.